Valley fever to me was like a, a cold. It's frustrating when you can't breathe and nobody knows why. You talk to people about valley fever and a lot of times they say, oh, it's no big deal, I had it. After two and a half months of just not knowing what was going on, I was diagnosed with valley fever. I never broke a leg or an arm in my whole life. I says, now you're gonna tell me you're gonna have an operation. He says, either that or you die. She snortled and she looked at us and she said, oh, don't go looking for valley fever. We live in Arizona, everybody's got it. We're probably breathing in the spores as we speak with the, all the wind that's been blowing for the past few days. All I did was do what everybody does. I took a breath of air and I got sick. Valley Fever, the impact on Arizonans. Hi, I'm Will Humble. I'm the Deputy Director for the Arizona Department of Health Services. And we're here to talk for a few minutes about Valley Fever. Uh, valley Fever is a disease that's really unique to Arizona. In fact, 60% of the folks that get Valley Fever uh, get it from somewhere here in the southern deserts, uh, the desert southwest. So there are some important things that you need to know as a resident of the desert southwest about the symptoms of Valley Fever, uh, what, you know, what the signs and symptoms are, and how you can recognize those symptoms and talk to your physician if you believe that you may have Valley Fever. So uh, I hope you enjoy this information. It's gonna be important uh, for you and your family. Valley Fever, or coccidioramycosis, coxy for short, is an infectious illness caused by breathing in spores from the fungus. The disease occurs in the southwestern United States, northern Mexico, and parts of Central and South America. The fungus grows naturally in the soil of dry desert climates and can survive intense heat and drought, which makes southern Arizona soil an ideal environment. If the soil is disturbed, be it by wind, construction, or outdoor activities, tiny spores break off of the fungus. The hot, dry desert winds whip up dust and can scatter the spores across great distances. 60% of all valley fever in the U.S. occurs in Arizona. And the majority of valley fever in Arizona occurs in Maricopa, Pima, and Pinal counties. People breathe in the spores. Breathing in even one spore can cause valley fever. Once inhaled, the spores reproduce, usually causing a disease in the lungs similar to pneumonia. He, he could only come up with the diagnosis of the pneumonia. I was diagnosed with pneumonia that day in the hallway. She listened and she heard a little something and I went and had chest x-ray. And she said, well, you've got pneumonia. About six in 10 people who get valley fever have only mild symptoms or no symptoms at all and develop immunity to the disease. Of those who experience symptoms, most have fatigue, fever, and cough. I just thought I was really run down. That rather than go to dinner, I just collapsed. I went straight to bed. I was just felled like a ponderosa. He would run a very high temperature. 104 and above. Stayed in bed all day long. And, and then Tuesday, I'll never forget this. I, I told my girlfriend, boy, something's up here. But, you know, I think I, I got a bad case of the flu or something. A person can have other symptoms such as chest pain, joint aches, or rash. I started having chest pains and the chest pains were unusual because they were very high and up in the ribcage, way up here. I, I felt like a little stinging thing in my lungs, uh, tired, irritable. And by that night, I had, I was full of purple blotches all over my legs. It's on my shoulders, my arms, my back, and my legs. Symptoms can last anywhere from a couple of weeks to many months or years with or without treatment. I'm 15 months into it and I'm 90%. I've had it for two years. 1980. In, in about three months, it'll be seven years since the surgery. It's been 17 years since I've been going through this. I spent about half of eight years, I know, in the hospital. When valley fever spreads beyond the lungs, it is called disseminated disease. Disseminated valley fever can be fatal, 
especially if the fungus spreads to the area around the brain and spinal cord, which is referred to as coxy meningitis. Lots of problems. I had a growth of a golf ball sized growth of valley fever, coxy, removed from the pawns of my brain stem, a little nine hour surgery. He said, have you ever seen a man or a woman die of their brain exploding? He says, your brain right now is ready to explode. Disseminated valley fever always requires treatment with antifungal drugs, and people with the most severe forms require treatment for the rest of their lives. I am still getting medication today. I needed to be on this antifungal for the rest of my life. Not everyone with valley fever requires treatment. In fact, healthy people with disease only in their lungs often need no treatment at all. But for those that require treatment, the drugs have many side effects, including hair loss and liver disease. And some can cause fever and chills and require careful medical monitoring. I had six months of antifungal, which was terrible and my hair was falling out and just I had no energy. Amphotericin kills all your blood veins. I couldn't eat because the medicine was making my stomach upset and the prednisone is horrible. It tastes terrible from the start and it just really wreaks havoc on your body. Well, we do have drugs and that's and we're glad we do. Dr. John Galgiani. Director, Valley Fever Center for Excellence. It used to be the only drug was very toxic and could only be given by vein. Over the last two decades, oral drugs have become available and we now use those almost all the time when we do treat patients with Valley Fever. But all of those drugs suffer from the problem that they don't cure the disease. So a new drug, especially one which might cure the disease, uh, could be extremely valuable, in fact, change the way we manage this problem altogether. All laboratories and physicians in Arizona are required to report cases of valley fever to the Arizona Department of Health Services. From these reports, we know that diagnosis of valley fever have been increasing through the state for the last decade. In 2007, almost 5,000 cases were reported. That's the second highest number we have ever seen in Arizona. The highest was in 2006 at 5,535. We also know that the rate of valley fever in persons over age 65 has almost tripled in the last decade. Older adults are the people most affected by this epidemic. And because Arizona sees 60% of all valley fever cases reported in the United States, this is Arizona's disease. Out of almost 5,000 valley fever cases reported to ADHS in 2007, we have interviewed every 10th person. Of those interviewed, 94% were insured. I have excellent insurance, I have very good insurance. So I'm one of the lucky ones. Just in the month of December alone, before they figured out that I had valley fever, it cost me over $500. And I have insurance. And the money. If you look at the, the financial side of it, the insurance companies are what, you know, just sit in a hospital for four days. And this is a costly disease. It can run up to be a lot of money. And I'm fortunate I have insurance right now. Statistically, about 20% of Arizonans are uninsured. These are likely to be lower income or unemployed persons. And they are at equal risk for getting the disease. I started my job here in October and wasn't uh, eligible for um, their health insurance until February. By this time, the 13 weeks that the insurance companies help you out are gone. Uh, you have no money coming in. You have to worry about losing this and that and providing for your children. I mean, fortunate for me, I had a job where I could afford to pay for it, but I feel bad for someone who wouldn't have the money to pay those co-pays because it was incredibly expensive.